What's going on guys, my name is Matt and today we're going to be doing a performance and feature comparison between the new RX 6500 XT and the RX 5500 XT. This is a particularly important comparison to look at in my opinion because the 6500 XT is a direct replacement for the 5500 XT. Beyond this, many PC gamers will upgrade every few years to the latest tier of their current card. For example, I have a friend who started out with a GTX 770, upgraded to a 970, and is now currently on a 1070. With each of those upgrades from the 770 to 970 to 1070, there were noticeable improvements in terms of increased video memory, newer features and ports, along with just an overall increase in gaming performance. So the goal of today's video is to put these two cards head to head and see if the 6500 XT is truly a worthy replacement for the 5500 XT. Now obviously the 6500 has been out for a few weeks now and to say the general outlook on this card is negative would be an understatement. With that being said I'll try and be as objective as possible presenting the pros, cons, progressions, and regressions between the two cards. So without further ado let's get into this comparison. So first off let's get some base stats out of the way in terms of release dates and prices. The 5500 XT released over two years ago in December of 2019 and it had two versions a 4GB model that retailed for $170 and an 8GB model that retailed for $200. We're going to be looking at the $200 8GB model in this video as I wanted the best example of a 5500 XT, again to see if the 6500 is truly a worthy replacement. Speaking of the 6500 XT, this card released just a few weeks ago in mid-January with an MSRP of $200 which is exactly the same as the 5500 this is replacing. Obviously pricing is all over the place right now but you can currently pick these 6500 6500s up on Newegg for as little as $270. Interestingly enough, if you're wanting an 8GB 5500 XT, you're looking at paying a minimum of $300 for a used card. Now there are numerous factors that play into this pricing differential, one of the biggest ones being mining viability, but the pricing should give you some indication of how gamers and miners are currently valuing each of these cards. Like I said before, with each new generation of cards, there's usually a slew of new features like a new encoder or support for the latest and greatest display standards, or even just an increase in video memory to keep up with the ever increasing requirements for modern games. When we look at this aspect of things, this is where we really start to see why there's so much hate around the 6500 XT. Instead of a new and improved hardware encoder, the 6500 XT emits one completely, which is very hard for many people, including myself, to wrap our heads around. In in terms of ports, the 6500 XT has a single HDMI port like most 5500 XTs, but unlike most 5500 XTs, the 6500 only has one display port versus the normal three. For video memory, the 6500 XT offers only one version with 4GB, which is half of what you could get with the higher version of the 5500. As you can see, corner after corner was cut with this card, but one of the biggest red flags is the fact it only uses a 4X PCIe 4.0 connection. This is versus the 8x PCIe 4.0 connection on the 5500, meaning this new card has half the theoretical bandwidth of the old one, which on a PCIe 3.0 board has the potential to hurt game performance, which is something I'll be testing in this video. The one area the 6500 XT does improve on, the 5500 XT, is the fact it does require slightly less power and only uses a 6-pin PCIe cable versus the 5500 XT's 8-pin. So now that you have a base understanding of the comparison, let's talk about the test hardware and get into the benchmarks. Both these cards used are pretty average representations of their respective GPUs. They both offer basic dual fan designs and both run well within the accepted temp range and clock speeds. For the system they're going into, I wanted something that wouldn't bottleneck these cards in any major way, but I also wanted something that would be a somewhat realistic pairing so no Ryzen 9s or i9s are being used. The CPU I went with is the Intel Core i5 11600K. This is being cooled by a 280mm Corsair water cooler, but it was run at stock speeds for these benchmarks. The CPU is sitting inside of the Z590 ASRock Steel Legend motherboard. There's 32GB of 3200MHz Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM, and there's a WD Blue SATA M.2 SSD that the OS and all the games are stored to. For benchmarks, I tested 6 games and one purely synthetic benchmark. These all have built in benchmarks to ensure accurate and comparable data. So without further ado, let's get into the benchmark numbers. 
So the first thing I wanted to test was 3 d Mark Time Spy. If you haven't heard of this, it's a synthetic benchmark that gives you a good understanding of your system's raw gaming performance. It does provide an overall score and CPU score, but we'll solely focus on the graphics score for this test. In this test, the 5500 XT managed to produce a graphics score of 4836. This is pretty good and looks to be well within the common range for a 5500 XT when looking at other people's results. So how does its replacement, the 6500 XT, fare? Well, using a PCIe 4.0 connection, the 6500 produced a graphics score of 4957 and a score of 4854 while using a PCIe 3.0 connection. That's a raw performance increase of 2.5 and 0.3% respectively, meaning the raw performance of this brand new card is almost exactly the same as the performance of the two year old card it's replacing. After seeing this, it got me very discouraged for the rest of the tests, but I decided to continue on as more gaming specific benchmarks may yield different results. One title that did actually see the 6500 XT produce higher performance was Rainbow Six Siege. In this game, the 5500 XT produced a 221 FPS average with 1% 1 lows of 168. Using a PCIe 4.0 connection, the 6500 XT produced a 248 FPS average with 1% 1 lows of 174. This is an increase in performance of 12.2 and 3.5% respectively for the average and 1% lows. Using the PCIe 3.0 connection, the number were only slightly lower with an average of 241 and 1% lows of 169. All of these tests were done at 1080p very high settings using the built-in benchmark and while there was an over 10% increase in average FPS, the very minor increase in 1% lows means that it won't really feel like much of an improvement at all while gaming. Next up is Borderlands 3, a hard to run AAA game. I test this at 1080p high settings using the built-in benchmark. In this game, we saw very close numbers between all three configurations with the biggest differential being around 5%. This is again disappointing to see the 6500 barely beating out the GPU it's meant to replace. Moving on to the next game, Hitman 3. This is a newer title and all three cards were tested using the built-in benchmark at 1080p high settings. Doing this resulted in the 5500 XT slightly beating out the 6500 XT with a PCIe 4.0 connection and handily beating the PCIe 3.0 connected 6500 by nearly 10%. This just shows that many games are going to have a noticeable performance decrease when using the 6500 XT on a 3.0 versus 4.0 connection. Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows results very similar to Hitman 3. The game was tested at 1080p high and the numbers between the 5500 XT and 6500 XT in both configurations were almost identical, but once the 6500 was moved down to a PCIe 3.0 connection I again saw a noticeable drop in performance. In Horizon Zero Dawn at 1080p high using the built-in benchmark, I found all three configurations to produce very similar results, with the 6500 XT using the 3.0 connection being ever so slightly worse than the other two. Finally, let's talk about Far Cry 6. I saved this for last as it was doing the weirdest things out of all the benchmarks. Using the 5500 XT, each run produced very similar results, but with both the 6500 configurations, the FPS would stay the same for a few runs, then slowly start to drop run after run. Restarting the game would fix it, but still I found this super weird. Something I also noticed was when first booting up the game, the graphics settings would say the VRAM requirements was too high for what the GPU had. Doing a run would slightly decrease the this requirement after each run. I'm not sure what this is all about or why it's happening, but it's really just one more nail in the 6500 XT's coffin. All in all, I did not expect performance to be so similar across so many games. I was hoping that even though tons of features were stripped back from the 6500 XT, that it would still perform a decent bit above the card it's meant to replace. So now comes the conclusion time. Overall, the 6500 XT is not a great card. If you could somehow find it at the $200 MSRP, then I think it does actually offer some amount of value, especially taking into account the fact it's a brand new card with a warranty. With that being said, at the $275 or more price it's going for right now, it makes it next to impossible to recommend. Sure, raw numbers on paper make it look decent when compared to other new offerings, but to me this card represents everything wrong with the current PC hardware market. I think there are people who will buy and enjoy using these cards, but based on the fact they're continuously in stock shows that the general public interest in this card is very low to say the least. I don't think I have as much hate for this card as other reviewers do, but I'm not going to applaud AMD.
AMD for releasing another RX 480 five years later with stripped down specs. If you are looking at this card and are dead set on buying a new card, my recommendation would be to save up an extra $100 or $150 more and buy an RX 6600, which represents a much better value for a new card at the moment. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.